Welcome to Simplify. I'm Caitlin Schiller. And I'm Ben Schumann Solar. Hi, Ben. What's up, Caitlin? We're okay. back. We're back. We're always back. I mean, we never went anywhere, really. I know. But what do we got today? All right. So, one of the things that people said they really, really love about Simplify is the variety. And that you listeners out there, you get ideas that you might otherwise never have been exposed to, that you might not have sought out yourself. And I think that this episode classes there. Dang, good hook. Mm-hmm. We are going to talk about bad English today. What do you think of when you hear bad English, Ben? When you say the word bad, it like reminds me of when uh, someone's like, how are you feeling? I'm mad. And then someone's like, dogs are mad. People get angry. Like, be more specific. Be more precise with your language. That ah, kind of stuff. I've never heard anyone say that. But oh, really? I'm, tell me about your trauma later. Or even like, <laughs> I'm doing good. No, you're doing well. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. That was a classic my dad thing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Bingo. There's always yeah. like an uncle or a dad <laughs> or a friend's dad yeah. or a substitute teacher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't be... know. Can you? <laughs> exactly. Right. Can right. I have a treat? I don't know. Right. I think you meant to say, <laughs> may I? Exactly. Yes. No, I'm going to say can. <laughs> Give me that chocolate. Because that's how people talk. <laughs> um, I am a descriptivist. I identify as a descriptivist. And today, we want you to know that... All right, so it wasn't until really the 18th century that standardization and grammar books even existed, and that is what drove a lot of the beliefs about what good and bad English is. 18th century grammar books. We no longer live in the 18th century. And most of those books were written by people in the upper class. They were a very specific set of people. They were upper class white guys. What am I saying? I'm just going to name it. And we still have some attachment to those styles. But today we have a linguist, Valerie Fridland. She works at the University of Nevada in Reno. And she wrote this book with a really great title. It's called like literally, dude. You and love, you, love the title. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the smile on my face. This I've never had. I don't think I've had a nerdier conversation on Simplify or for Simplify ever. Um, it was a delight, and I, I have to say, I love this book. And Fridlin wrote it to get people to understand that just because we dislike something, it doesn't mean that it's bad English. It just means that we've been trained from this social and cultural moment in our lives that it's not really what's socially preferred. Yeah, sociolinguistics. That's what she says. She's a sociolinguist. A sociolinguist, yes. That's pretty cool. What never a even cool knew, title. Yeah, bad as title, That's job a, title. Truly. Um, what? So what's one thing that people should look out for? There are so many things. I think the thing that I'm taking away from this is that whenever you're a stylistic leader in some way, you're going to take some flack. People are going to look at you because you're out in the front of the pack, whether that's because of the way that you use language or something else. And we're going to hear a lot about that today. So buckle in. We're going to hear about like. We're going to hear about pitch and vocal folds. We're going to hear about the word dude and the surprising origin of bruh. (laughs) And uh, I think it's going to be really fun. And it's going to teach you how you can kind of use bad English to your advantage if you understand it. And... Um, there will be a guide again. We've been trying this out, sort of like a Simplify Premium kind of thing, but you can get it for free if you wait for the voucher code at the end of this episode <laughs> and then get Blinkist and then just search for Valerie Friedland um, or search for Simplify and you will find some extra stuff that we had to cut from the interview, some more book recommendations, some more Caitlin, and it'll be good fun. We recommend it. It's worked out so far, so we're going to keep it going. People love the guides. People love Simplify, so why not? I want to say my favorite part of the interview is actually a part that only appears in this guide. So if you you like linguistics and you enjoyed this interview, you definitely need to check it out. Sweet. Let's roll the tape, right? We'll be back with a couple book recommendations and uh, some more takeaways. Yeah, let's do it. Would you, before we start out, would you please introduce yourself the way that you like to be introduced? Well, so many titles. I think, you know, my first most important one is uh, I'm a mom, Um, although I'm a mom to teenagers. So these days I sometimes wish I wasn't. (laughs) But in addition to that, I am a professor of linguistics, most specifically a field called sociolinguistics, which, of course, we can get into what that involves. And I'm also a writer. I write for um, the general audience in blogs. So I have a blog that comes out monthly with Psychology Today. And I also have a book um, that just released called Like Literally Dude, Arguing for the Good in Bad English, which I think we're going to talk about today. We absolutely are. Did your, did the fact that you were a mom to two teenagers, did you say two? Two, yes, two. Yeah. Did that influence the title of your book? It did, actually. I mean, the whole book. (laughs) 
I, you know, I do this for a living. This is what I study is how language evolves over time and how um, young speakers and women actually tend to push language forward and have historically done this. This book is a culmination of many, many things, but one of the big things it is, it's a culmination of how I synthesized my experience as a researcher and my knowledge of, of language and sort of the contemporary speech habits that we love to hate that especially emerge in young people's speech and in my own kid's speech. And my, mom, my daughter is an avid like user, for example. And my son <laughs> yeah. is an avid duder, so he dudes mm-hmm. me all the time. And mm-hmm. how that sort of helped me to embrace those. And they, they drove me to do the research on what those features were, where they came from, what their history is, what their purpose was. And I wanted to share that with everybody else. So there were a lot of other things, also women that I know that have struggled in their careers because of the way they speak and how they were judged for it. Men that I know that sort of have asked me how they can get things out of their speech, which is really not what I do. I help people appreciate what's in it and understand how it works. Mm. But I've had a lot of different people ask me those questions. So that coupled with being a mom really drove forward everything I've put out in this book. Now, I actually think this is a really, really good segue into why why do people hate like so much? What is that about? And what 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 if a defense of like sound like? <laughs> sound like now you notice that there's like everywhere, don't you? We do like, like is in my everywhere. yes, we do like in my classes where I have the students study them, and it's so funny because the day we talk about like. There are peals of laughter every single time someone utters a like from that point onward because it's so prevalent and then people can hear them everywhere. Once you notice them, you hear them everywhere. Uh, so what, what's really interesting about like is I think you made a bunch, uh, several good points about what we feel towards people that say like a lot. And one is that we tend to dismiss them as uncertain or not knowledgeable, as flighty, as vacuous, and devalue the purpose of like. But like is a lot older than we think, for one. It is actually uh, several centuries old, the discourse marker use of like. It's really a feature of British English. And um, we find it in criminal court trials from the 1700s. Uh, So, you know, conversational speech. So it's not a new thing. And people didn't really notice it until it became really strongly associated with one particular speaker group, with Southern California and Valley Girls and, you know, Moon Unit Zappa and her song that she had, uh, I think it was called Valley Girl, where she used a lot of like in sort of a, a funny way. She was making fun of that sort of carefree Southern California Valley Girl lifestyle. And I think this points to our trouble with like, uh, as I think, you know, as a thread in the book, you see that a lot of times women lead in language change and have historically There are lots of reasons for that. But um, the interesting thing is what happens is because women tend to be at least a generation, if not more, ahead of men in adopting new changes into the language, changes that often become the norm in subsequent generations, they often get demonized for overuse of a feature that's prevalent in their speech, but not other people's because they're leaders in linguistic change. And whenever you're stylistic leaders, you take the risk of being looked at for what you're doing as outside the norm. And whatever traits and qualities have been associated with you historically or stereotypically get associated with your speech features. So how we view women as sort of being flighty and vacuous and empty headed or not able to really contribute to conversations and they're chatty and all that stuff and what they say is gossip, right? Those historically based beliefs we have about women's talk get put on the features that are prevalent in their speech. And that is exactly what we see happening with like, because women led in the use of like, they were the early adopters of like in the social stylistic use that we have it today. You know, this like that sort of populates uh, the beginning of sentences, the middles of sentences and quotative like, where we use it as a verb, like to say that made others then react to that use of like as if it was were exceptional uses and that it was associated with these qualities of young women as being not professional, not really knowledgeable, not certain about what they say when there's really nothing uncertain about like. It's actually no different than other features that it alternates with, but because we don't mind those features, they're not new and novel and associated with women. We don't have any problems with them, but when like substitutes one-to-one for those features that we do use with purpose, 
we demonize it because of it's associated with young women. So I, you know, it's really an interesting historical path that like has traveled. Uh, and I think that is why it bothers people. Of course, if you look at why it's used and why it's so prevalent, it's obviously meeting a need that we have. And a lot of that need is the increasing subjective sensibility and evaluative nature of what we say to each other. So we're more intimate, more informal. And when we tell stories, for example, we now tell them, and this is a shift over the last 50 years with much more of this subjective sensibility. So we often tell stories or talk to each other and express our own thoughts about what was going on while it was happening. So we basically are telling the person we're talking to in this moment something about what we were feeling and processing in the events that we're describing to them. Uh, so when you think about telling a story, when you're saying something about what happened to you, you know, yesterday, you might have had a bad experience and you'll tell someone, I was like, I can't believe this is happening to me. So you're telling them something about your thought processing of the original events. Well, that requires subjectivity and like is the ultimate in subjectivity because the word like in most of its uses, for example, as a preposition or a conjunction is to set up a comparison. And that allows us to then say, okay, this is like this. So um, his eyes were like the sky, which sets up a similarity or comparison, but in exactness. So it's not an exact thing you're saying that his eyes aren't the sky, they're like the sky. So we take that subjectiveness of the word like, and we apply it in a new context to allow us this more subjective sensibility in what we're talking about. So it's actually very valuable, but people dismiss it because of its association with women. Oh, that's so interesting. It gives us, yeah, it, it sort of, I wouldn't say softens, but it it sort of broadens a perspective rather than making it s strictly factual and allows more relatedness maybe in speech rather than stating of facts that's more relational. That's sort of the sense I'm getting. Yeah, and more subjective. And mm. I think the trick is people think subjectivity is bad. Mm. So, you know, if you are saying something, you want to be absolutely firm, but certainty is is really overrated <laughs> in, the in the sense that how many things do we need to actually state for sure? A lot of our conversations are about things that are our beliefs, our ideas, our thoughts, our hypotheses, and we express certainty and uncertainty in language all the time. Do you ever say possibly? Do you ever say maybe? Do you ever say might? Do you ever say could? All of those are epistemic markers. What mm -hmm. that means is they're markers of the extent of certainty. So like is just another one of those features. And we just don't like it because of its association historically with young women. Right. But it's inaccurate because actually young men use it too. So I just want to make sure people know that too. <laughs> they do. Before we move on to young men and talk about dude, which is one of my favorite words, to be honest, uh, I wanted to talk for a moment about pitch. I thought that the section on pitch, especially pitch in women, was really, really, really interesting. Lower for women is right, power, right. but also masculinization, which is a thing I think about a lot, being a woman with a pretty low voice. Um, can you talk a little bit about how how pitch works against women and for women and how it's different for men? Oh, sure. That's a fascinating area. And of course, we could talk the whole time about that alone, but I'll try to keep it fairly short. Um, pitch is a really interesting area of research because we find that we have a lot of associations with pitch. We, we pitch is not just about, you know, what your average speaking voice is. Pitch also seems to send social signals. And a lot of these from an evolutionary standpoint have been looked at as something that might reflect our early associations with body size and dominance. So, you know, if you have bigger, thicker vocal folds, they vibrate at a slower rate. And that basically is what low pitch is. It's a slower rate of vibration of the vocal folds. But if you have longer, thinner um, vocal folds, lighter vocal folds, they vibrate at a faster rate. And you can sort of see this with different size rubber bands. You know, if you if you can avoid popping yourself with them and you stretch different size rubber bands on your fingers and then ding them, you know, so they vibrate, you'll see that thinner rubber bands vibrate at a faster rate. So that's basically what your vocal folds are. They're essentially your speech Ooh. rubber bands. <laughs> so, so interesting. <laughs> I know. Isn't that great? Now you know that. Um, they don't pop you quite as often and painfully as rubber bands do, but that's what they are. 
generally speaking, men have larger body size, larger vocal folds, thicker vocal folds than women, which presents as lower pitch. So on average, um, there is quite a bit of Hertz difference in the, the pitch that's produced by male vocal folds and female vocal folds. Well, if we look at ratings of traits for voice pitch, so lower pitch voices versus higher pitch voice, what we find is this really interesting, very consistent research that suggests that lower pitched voices for both men and women receive higher ratings on dominance, authority, competence, and even trustworthiness scales. I think that I have received perhaps unfair advantages for being a tall, large, powerful woman with a low speaking voice. And I, when I was reading this section, I was like, oh, Kaylin, you do have some evolutionary unfair advantage here. Well, uh, hey, take it. Embrace it. You can. You yeah. know, women, women need all the help we can get uh, in the world, right? Yeah. So women have a higher pitch voice, which then is perceived as less authoritative, less dominant, right? Less competent. Yet, it's perceived as more attractive for women. So men actually are more attractive with lower voices. If we look at how people rate them, women are more attractive with higher voices. So if you're going into a professional workplace, you have a bit of a double bind because to be taken seriously, to be authoritative, to be viewed as sort of more dominant in that workplace, you have to have a lower voice. But to be feminine, to be attractive, you have to have a higher voice. So we really have a double bind as women. And, you know, there have been different ways we've tried to come around that. And, you know, you look at Margaret Thatcher. She's a famous example of someone who actually worked to lower her voice pitch to be more authoritative. But there was an Australian study done in the 1990s that showed that over the last 50 years, Australian women had lowered their voice pitch over time, probably as more and more women entered professional circles. And and this seems to be correlative of uh, the increased visibility of women in professions that were historically male. And it's sort of an attempt to try to remedy this problem of uh, not being taken seriously. Uh Uh-huh. That makes a lot of sense to me. But then move us out of the professional field and move into, say, a a romantic field and a low voice is not as attractive. Right. And I think, you know, we have to mediate this by these are studies that look just at voice quality. So, Mm -hmm. you know, your spectacular personality shines through and I'm sure uh, (laughs) is considered extremely attractive. So there are other factors in the real world that would make you more attractive. (laughs) Um, But so what's interesting is, yes, so you if you are in the workplace and lowering your voice for that effect. And I think a famous example of that is Elizabeth Holmes. Did you hear about that story? Yeah, I did. She was often accused of being inauthentic because of the very low voice she adopted in a professional Mm -hmm. workplace. So it's an interesting case where our ideas about what this woman should sound like based on what we think she looks like and who we think she is as a woman really clashed with the voice that she had in her professional circle. So we see that this is a double bind for women when they're out in society and they're trying to be, you know, feminine and have this problem that they either have a low voice for work or a high voice for femininity. So what's a good solution? Well, what if you took your normal higher voice and you added tinges of low pitch to it to kind Mm -hmm. of accommodate both sides? And that is exactly what we see happening in the use of vocal fry, which is Mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a sort of tone, a popping, a slight low, low pitch popping that comes at the end of sentences. So I'll, in case people don't know what it sounds like, it would sound kind of like this, where my voice is a little more poppy. Uh-huh. Uh, at very end, Paris Hilton. And, yes, very much. Or uh, Kim Kardashian or, also yeah. has it. Um, mm-hmm. We also hear a lot of complaints about it uh, with NPR reporters. A lot of female NPR reporters have been um, harassed and harangued by listeners for their vocal fry. But I think if we look at why vocal fry has become prevalent and what it signals to women, for women, especially young women, if we do studies on perception of vocal fry, they see it as urban and professional. Older speakers often don't like it. Um, What's interesting is actually in Britain, vocal fry is more prevalent among men. But we don't hear people complaining about it there. So it's only when it's associated with women. Again, we see this vicious cycle of women's voices sort of being demonized because they tend to lead in something new and novel. So interesting. Okay. We've spent a lot of time talking about the double binds in which women find themselves in terms of speech, the way that we talk and how we sound. I do want to turn just for a minute 
to dude because it is a wonderful (laughs) word. I love to use it as a woman of a certain age, an aging millennial. Dude came into my lexicon pretty early. I dude my female friends. I dude everybody. Um, I've less so now that I've lived in Europe for 15 years or so, but it is a wonderful word. What is, what does dude do like sociologically? I just love the alliteration of what dudes do. Actually, <laughs> just asking that, what do dudes do? I, I love dude. I I will say, and my son, who is seventeen now, when he was little, and that word first came into his vocabulary, I think he's seven or eight. He duded everybody all the time, and me included, constantly. And that's really what piqued my interest in the word because I thought, boy, it's really doing some interesting social work for him. And what we don't tend to think about when we are just sort of speakers and not linguists is we don't think about what social work is this choice doing for me over another choice I could make. So it has to be doing something for them for it to have become so prevalent. And with young men, there is a cultural model of young men that rewards young men that give a sort of bravado, a masculine, a kind of chutzpah in their speech that um, we can sort of take to mean that they're strong, they're tough, they're macho. And, and young boys get rewarded culturally for giving off that air. So instead of going for very, very standard, correct speech features from a prescriptivist standpoint, young men tend to be very attracted towards speech forms that give off this air of masculinity and solidarity and camaraderie in a very strictly heterosexual way, typically, um, that they can reap those sort of cultural rewards when they use them. Dude actually has a really interesting history, and its early history will surprise you. It actually meant to be a dandy or a fop with an ostentatious regard for fashion, which is 160 degrees different than what it means today. So it was... It was more of an effeminate, you know, insult. In fact, you only used it in ridicule or mockery in the 1880s. And in fact, there were duels because of it, um, defamation lawsuits because of being called a dude. Oh, my God. Dude duels. Terrible. uh, Dude duels. (laughs) I know. Wow, dude. Uh, (laughs) We could go on with the dude jokes forever, right? Yeah. But it, it, it has changed so much because in the 1930s and 40s, when dude had sort of lost the dandy affectation association and it became to mean something somebody was overdressed or flashy in their clothing style, but it sort of lost the effeminate quality. That was why we get the word dude ranch, because it means an overdressed, you know, non-Westerner, essentially. But in the 1930s and 40s, the zoot suit uh, riots were really um, in the American imagination. And zoot suitors, the African-Americans and the Mexican-American pachuchos that were really prevalent and leading this, this movement, they wore these zoot suits, right, that were all about this really cool, edgy fashion trend. And they called each other dude. And dude to them represented the sort of style and flashy dressing that they did. So it called out other men when they called, they duded them for their really cool, edgy fashion choice. But it also meant, look, dude, we get it. We're both facing this serious cultural prejudice and this dangerous, subversive um, label that's been put on us because the zoot suit riots were caused because the wearers of the zoot suit actually often were viewed as dangerous and rebellious. So they were often, um, you know, outlawed. In fact, you were in some cities, you weren't allowed to wear a zoot suit. So by wearing one, you were facing danger. And so by duding someone, not only were you saying, hey, dude, I get you, you, you look sharp, man, but you're also saying, I get you in terms of what we're trying to do here, the cultural change we're trying to enact, the danger that we're in. So it became this sort of subculture culture, counterculture, nonconformist word to call other men in a very heterosexual sort of camaraderie kind of way. And of course, this was a a emotion that many people, especially men, identified with, especially in subculture. So this is where it got taken into surfer and druggie subculture, where it became really more about this chill, laid back lifestyle and this sort of counterculture edginess. And of course, that's very attractive to young men. So that is what really prompted its use in the more mainstream young male adult population. And as it became less about being a dude and more about being sort of just noticing this cool, chill camaraderie between people, it 
jump from being just a male feature to being an anybody feature for anybody that shared that idea of being able to call out other people to recognize a shared experience and to kind of commiserate. And that's why women can do each other today. Dude. Aww. <laughs> well, thanks, dude. That was a very complete explanation. I I enjoyed it. And I've noticed lately the rise of bruh. Is is bruh doing the same thing as dude? Absolutely. You know, I mean, the problem with words as they age out and then people like you and I who are not 20 can say them um, <laughs> is that they become less cool mm. and less innovative. And so it is the natural course for younger speakers to move away from them because they no longer carry the meaning they originally did once anybody can use them. Right. And they come up with new ways to do the same thing. And bra is one of those ways. And um, bra is actually, I believe, a, a derivative of, of a Hawaiian pigeon um, sort of solidarity marker. So, you know, in Hawaiian pigeon bra is very, very common. And I actually believe that's where it comes from, but it is the same. It's doing the same work, but it's still like, I couldn't bra somebody. It wouldn't work. It really hasn't jumped that age divide to be something that I could normally and naturally say, but I can do somebody. So it's Mm. really still a youth marker at this point, but yes, absolutely. It's basically taking up the same work as dude did. Interesting. I Hawaiian pigeon. I just assumed that that bra was a shortened version of brother, and it also came from hip hop culture. But I, I wanted to ask you if there's if there's one thing that you wish people understood better about quote bad English. What what is it like? What would you what do you hope that people get from this interview? Well, you know, I think, first of all, just language is fascinating and fun, and we often don't think about it in the ways that linguists do, and um, when we learn how language works, it's so eye-opening to helping us understand why we say the things we say and why other people say things that we might not like, but that are actually not wrong or bad, but just misunderstood. And so I think there are two main things I want to have people take away, um, three, actually. The first is I language is fun. And it's silly and it's fascinating. And so that's just part of what the book is about. You know, all these fun facts about language you can learn. And I try to be funny in it. So it should be a fun read. And that's one thing I just want to, I want to make sure people enjoy language because I enjoy it so much. I can confirm it is a fun read. And I was really impressed (laughs) with, with the fluidity of, of registers that you sort of run up and down through the book. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. And so, you know, I think part of it is just that I want people to just have fun with it. But I think the two bigger picture, big ideas I want people to take away way is one that just because we dislike something, it uh, doesn't mean that it's bad English. It just means that we've been trained from a social cultural moment in our lives um, that this is not what's preferred socially to mm. use because that's really what they are. They're social rules. Yeah. The second thing is that it's the natural course of language to change and it's the natural state of evolution to be driven by certain groups in society over and over throughout history. And so if we can look at language from that perspective, that it's evolution, not dissolution, I think we'll actually come to terms with changes in our speech in a much happier way than we currently tend to look at them. Welcome to the, like, bookend. (laughs) Like, totally. <laughs> Where we end with books. Dude. Don't be such a valley girl, which is pejorative. It is absolutely pejorative. Uh, this idea of what language should be, mm-hmm. I think, is very interesting. That mm-hmm. we all have this idea of what language should, like in quotes, should mm-hmm. do, should be, or ought to be. There's some mm-hmm. kind of yeah moral imperative behind how what we all think about yeah. language, right? Mm-hmm. This exchange you two had about dude and how it's transformed and evolved Mm -hmm. is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of belonging, man, there's so much in here that I that I that I loved. Yeah, I I really recommend the book. I really really recommend actually getting it. It's such a fun book, and she writes with such tremendous range. It's funny, it's academic, but it's never stuffy. It's a really easy, delightful read. But what I've been thinking about since I I did the interview and since I've listened to it is um, how the word like is the ultimate in subjectivity. She says that yeah. we're telling people something about what we were feeling and processing at the time when we use like, especially in this way, when you say, I was like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Right. You're you're giving them an, an inner look into, you're giving them a look into what your inner world and what your inner experience is, which I think is cool because language, hopefully, what you're doing when you're communicating is is 
you're building a bridge. And like can help you be more rela- – like can help whatever you're trying to transmit be even more relational if you let it. It's affiliative. It's not – it's not just there as a grammatical particle or something. It's right. there because it's building relationship between you and your subjective world and whoever's listening. And I think that's a really interesting, cool thing. I think the phrase that I, the phrase I wrote down for sure is extent of certainty. Not just like, but also might or could. You hear a lot of feedback sometimes about like, don't qualify yourself so much. Mm. You know, don't just say the thing. I mean, this mm. is something people used to tell me and something I've told uh, people also mm-hmm. like, you know, when you're saying a point, just say the point. If you have an opinion, express your opinion. Don't then say, I mean, it mm-hmm. could be. I mean, it could. I mean, you know, this mm-hmm. kind of like e- express certainty and then and and that's OK. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that how you talk matters, not just what words you use, but how you speak, how you speak matters to when you speak to your kids, Mm -hmm. how you speak matters when you speak to your partner or Mm -hmm. to your friends, how you speak matters at work. Mm -hmm. It does matter. And it's it's something that we don't maybe spend as much time thinking about. Yeah. I mean, we talk about communication. We go to like Mm -hmm. communication workshops and stuff and we talk about that. We don't just think about the basics, how you speak. The way we speak matters. Mm. Do you got books? I got books. All right. I always got books. Let's uh, let's do books. Well, why don't you go first this time? Me? Yeah. Man. Okay, I have a book by James Pennebaker. Baker, sorry, he's a psychologist. He's at uh, the University of Texas right now. The book is called "The Secret Life of Pronouns." Cool. Um, and not like only pronouns: she, her, he, him, they, etc., which is uh, maybe what the discourse has turned pronouns into. But pronouns are also little, little ways, little words, mm-hmm. prepositions, and stuff in mm-hmm. his book. So um, one cool anecdote from this is he, Pennebaker, was one of the first people to use a computer and, and like, analyzer to look at language. Huh. So what he did was he created – this is in the 1980s. He created, like, a program to analyze language, and he had people who had experienced serious trauma write about it, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they analyzed it using this computer program, which is called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count – which just sounds like a computer program from the 1980s. I like that. <laughs> uh, and they tallied all the words in the essays that related to specific psychological concepts, so like words that might relate to anger, like hate, rage, kill, revenge, mm. counted those up. And then they did the same thing with other psychological states, and they found that um, those who use more positive words like love, care, and happy are people who had a better improvement in mm. their condition. So like this has opened up a whole world of linguistic analysis mm. uh, and I again how we use you know how we speak matters what words we use actually matters and it reminds me also a little bit of the Hansons and how we think about our brain and how we can frame how we experience the world mm-hmm. you know um, but I don't want to go too much into that but that's the book uh, The Secret Life of Pronouns and James Pennebaker if you're into this you know linguistic stuff of this episode you could check it out he um, his wiki page says what his work is about is, quote, how everyday language reflects basic social and personality processes, which cool. sounds like right up your alley. Yeah, it does. What's okay. your book? <clears throat> All right. So my book is called Language Intelligence. It's Lessons on Persuasion from Jesus, Shakespeare and Lady Gaga by Joseph J. Rom. So I think this is a cool one. This episode of the Dr. Fridlin has been all about understanding how bad English can be can be to our advantage in some ways and why it's actually valuable and what it's doing behind the scenes. And this book is all about diving into the mechanics of what's going on in sort of agreed upon good English. So, you know, globally agreed upon excellent rhetoric. You can kind of understand the mechanics of why things like political campaigns and advertising and really, really compelling speeches, why they're powerful and what they're doing. And it's it's exciting. I think it's a really great book. And it reminded me of my dusty old literature background and made me get out my necessary Shakespeare the other day. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy how much these things have affected. I mean, like you, you two talk about this 18th century grammar book. Mm-hmm. Uh, ancient things affect us through the years. I, one thing I like when you go hiking in the Alps, he said, not at all humble bragging. <laughs> and you see people still saying servus. And uh-huh. in southern Germany, you also see that a lot. Mm. Servus is how the Romans greeted each other, citizen mm. to citizen. You know, So 
uh, the fact that it's still used 2,000 years later is pretty awesome. Yeah. And then you hear different versions of it. But, you know, the, some people say, hey, hi, you know, hola, whatever. Mm-hmm. What um, the ass? <laughs> exactly. There's a million ways to just to greet someone. And some of it is ancient, ancient, ancient. Yeah. Um, and some of it is new in a weird way. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that these the, the, the oldest ones, the oldest forms are often in these little ritualized moments of meeting between human beings and right. like – collaboration i think of funnily enough i just made this sound and i was thinking of like when you cheers and say sante yeah or brindis or something it's it's like these some of the oldest moments are these like deeply ingrained human rituals of celebration and greeting sweet this okay is a deeply wow. nerdy episode yeah of simplify. Cool. Well, we're, yeah we're giving people <laughs> something to walk away from i wanted to give people the idea of like that's a core thing that language is an evolution, not a dissolution. Yeah, I and, love that. And so, like, how do you, how can you evolve, you know, how you speak? And I how think, you think about how other people speak. For sure, yeah. Whether or not it's correct is not the most important thing. It really isn't. Is Are you communicating? Yeah. Can you have a human experience with a human that you are trying to talk to? Yeah. That's what, that's what matters to me, anyway, in language. And if you can learn about how to do that a little bit better, even if it means just letting go a little bit. I think that's a triumph in your own language evolution. That's that's been in mind. Awesome. Yeah. You can write to us, podcast at Blinkist.com. You can always write to us there. I'm at Caitlin Schiller on Twitter, but I'm never really there. So at C. Shills on Instagram. C. Shills. C. Shills. Ben, yeah. they find you? I'll just, whatever. Ben at Blinkist.com or podcast at Blinkist.com is the best way to reach me. And um, we have another coupon code, right? We do. A voucher code, I mean. 14. This one is just uh, Dr. Fridland's name. So it's Fridland, F R I D. L-A-N-D. Sweet. And yeah, you can use that, sign up for Blinkist, and then check out the guide for, for Caitlin's favorite part of the interview, one of Caitlin's favorite part of the interviews that was it's cut. It's definitely my favorite part of the interview. I'm curious. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can check out some of the other guides when you're there. And that's it. This was a really fun episode. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Simplify was produced by me, Ben Schumann-Solar, you, me. Caitlin Schiller. I just wanted to say me. Go ahead. No, do the other ones. No. Phoebe McIndoo. <laughs> yes. Odie Constantino. Mm-hmm. And a world of people that came before us and will come after us, like they say in yoga class. <laughs> and will influence the way that we speak, think, forever. and write forever. Like Bill Shakespeare. Indeed. Old Billy. Yeah. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Check it out. <laughs>